This evening, I was given the privilege of selecting who would be the speaker to our ordinance, sort of the last, the last admonition, the last advice. And when given that privilege, it was an easy decision for me because the person I've selected, when I sit under her teaching, I am always moved, I'm always grateful, I'm always better, I'm always more Christ-like. And so it's a privilege for me tonight to introduce to you, and I invite you to welcome Reverend Stephanie Tagg tonight. Well, ordinance, here we are. I don't know about you all, but I am actually a little bit freaked out in this moment when Wes texted me and asked me if I would share with you all this evening. The Lord said, you have to. And I said, well, I don't think I can, um, but here I am because he told me to. And honestly, uh, we're going to keep it quick and simple because I know your minds are on so many other things right now. You're thinking through the last however many years you have walked to get to this point, and you're thinking about the future and what comes next. You're also wondering if you're going to remember all of the things they ask you to say when it's your turn to respond, um, and I promise you will, and even if you don't, it's okay. You'll still be ordained <laughs> at the end, but actually, I'm really honored and excited to have these moments with you this evening. Because as I stand here today, I have a unique perspective on this beautiful, holy occasion. Because you see, I have been both the spouse of the ordinan and the ordinan myself. And I can look at each one of you sitting here and say, I have literally been in your shoes. And that's going to be what drives our conversation today. But first, I want to remind you of what a high and holy calling this is. You have been chosen by God, called by him to do the good works that he planned for you long ago. Jeremiah 1.5 reminds us, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's room. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. And then Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Your call was established by God long ago. Before there was you, probably before the beginning of time, because, you know, God is completely outside of time. He has always been and always will be. He is all-knowing, which means he knew you. And he knew your call always for eternity you are called. And today, you are going to declare your yes to that call in front of and with the full support of all of these people who have gone before you. Your calling is to go where God calls and do what he asks you to do. And spouses, I want to take just a moment to make it clear today that you are also called. In this moment, your calling is to love and support your spouse and to live out whatever call the Lord has placed on your life specifically. Because you may be fully called to the ministry of the church that your spouse is employed, or maybe you may be fully called to ministry in your home to your spouse or your children, or you may be fully called to the career that he has called you into primarily. But for today, in this moment, you will be stating your support for your spouse's ordination and your willingness to enter into this life together. It's a thing you do together. Because remember, I've been in both of these places. 19 years ago, 
I had just given birth to our first child, literally two weeks before ordination. It was an extremely traumatic event. Uh, in fact, the fact that myself and our daughter are alive today is a miracle. And still, I made it to Rapid City for ordination. I traveled across the state. There was no way that I was going to miss being part of this important day for my husband and for myself. And I remember that day so clearly. I remember walking down the center aisle in the very, very warm tabernacle <laughs> before we had those big air conditioner things. I remember that Phil and I stood together and in this moment, we we're full of hope. We were full of joy, anticipation, ambition. We were full of the knowledge that God had plans for us. And we were at the beginning of what was going to be a great adventure. I can honestly say I have no idea who said anything that day at the ordination. I do remember kneeling with Phil and Steve Selfridge praying over us. I remember Isaac saying to Phil, you, sir, are an ordained minister in the Wesleyan Church. And that was a beautiful moment. Fast forward 17 years. Through our journey of ministry together, I had said yes to God's call on my life to become an ordained minister. And in August of 2020, I again walked down the center aisle. Everything was a little bit different that year because it was 2020. We were all in different places. All of us that are in this room together had to attend ordinations all across the Northwest District. We were in Sioux Falls for my ordination and not here in Rapid. And I do miss that I missed out on that a little because I love all of you so much. There was also something different about me in that moment. Because the years of ministry that we had done together, I had no ideological thoughts about what I was about to do. In fact, this moment for me was full of resolve. I knew the realities of ministry. I knew what it took to lead people to the heart of God. I knew the joy, that joy that we expected. I knew that joy that we had experienced. But I also knew the hard things. And there are some really hard things about ministry. And as I responded to all those questions that you'll respond to in just a few minutes, I did so knowing that there is no way I could have responded without knowing that this is exactly where God wanted me to be. And the year that followed my ordination was probably the hardest year of mine and Phil's lives. In fact, there was one point that we began asking if we could even continue on in ministry. I was reflecting on this today as we sang together at district conference, remembering that last year I couldn't even open my mouth for words to come out. I could only stand there and cry. Just one year after my ordination, I was wondering if all of the work and all of the pain and all of the joy was for nothing. Obviously, I'm here right now, so the answer to that question was yes, it was worth it. It was so worth it. But how did I come to that conclusion? And the answer to that question is what I want you to take hold of and remember today. And because I'm a good Wesleyan, I'm going to share this in a three-point answer. Um, my husband said if I was a super Wesleyan, I would alliterate, but I'm just a little too rebellious for that. So um, here's my answer. Number one, my call. Number two, perseverance. And number three, love. First of all, I knew that I was called. 
Honestly, I knew that I was called from the time I was a little girl um, with the tape recorder recording myself sharing the gospel and singing songs. I was sure of my call when I said yes to the Lord when he called me to be a pastor's wife, um, even though I had absolutely no prospect of a husband at that point in time. I was sure of my call every single year that I met with the DBMD. I was sure of my call in my ordination interview, and I was sure that the Lord was not about to let me off the hook. The two scriptures from earlier, Jeremiah 1.5 and Ephesians 2.10, were reminders. Who did I think I was if I thought that just because things were hard, the call that God had placed on my life, the God of the universe had placed on my life, was null and void. I could not escape the high and holy calling. I could not escape that I was chosen by God and called by him to do the good things he planned for me long ago. You are called. Your call has been confirmed by others, and today you will make a public testimony of that call. And this is a moment to hold on to. Number two, perseverance. I mean, a life of following Jesus is not a life of ease and leisure. Not for us as pastors, not for any person choosing to follow Jesus. As much as we would like it to be, as much as we would like to listen to the sermons that promise prosperity when we follow Jesus, that is not the call. You know this. You've read the scriptures, but here's just a little reminder from John 16, 33. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And this is the truth that keeps us going, that leads us to persevere. Jesus has overcome. If my life is supposed to reflect his, then there will be suffering. In fact, nothing I face here on earth, no amount of angry emails or people that leave our church because there's a woman preaching, not the moments I sit in sorrow with families that are suffering tragedy and loss, there is no hardship that compares to what Jesus endured in leaving the glory of heaven, becoming a man and dying on the cross for our sin, for our benefit. If my life should reflect his, then I can lean on his promise of overcoming the world. I can persevere, and so can you. Third, love. This one's really important, and it's where I probably will get a little bit ooey-gooey, because one thing that God has asked me to do is to lead people into intimacy with him. And so I really like to talk about love, um, because truly, love is what drives all of this. Love for the Lord, his love for us, and his love for those that he has called us to love and lead. Listen, I love Jesus, and I know you do as well, or you would not be sitting here today. Love for him compels us to obedience. Love for him compels us to love others. Love for him leads our hearts to break for those that don't yet know the Lord or know the freedom that comes from him. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells us you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Love is the reason you should be sitting here today. It sums up the law and prophets. It's the foundation of all we believe. A burning desire to bring honor and glory to the Lord is what held me fast to my call and compelled me to persevere. When my focus is on loving God and loving others, I can set aside, you can set aside your selfish desires. 
and you begin to desire for others the beauty and wholeness that you have found in Jesus. And this leads us every day to sticking with this call and gives us the strength to persevere. So I'm going to leave you with this. You are called. You've stated that fact. You've allowed the DBMD to question and confirm your call. This life of ministry, it's not easy. It's worth it, but it's not easy. But we can persevere as we follow in the footsteps of our Savior. And those footsteps, they're full of love. Love Jesus with all that you are. Love the people he puts in your path. Know that he loves you. And here's where it gets really mushy. And so do I. I love you. I'm going to pray for you now. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this moment that we sit together, that we acknowledge your beauty and your holiness, and we acknowledge the fact that you have called us and invited us into sharing you with everyone around us. Thank you for that. Jesus, I pray for each of these ordinands that on the days that it's hard, on the days where it's a little scary, that you'll just give them courage as they persevere through, as they look to you as the one who guides their calling, reminding them that they are loved, that they are yours, and that you have called them to love others. Thank you so much, Jesus. We love you. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. So if we'd have our ordinance stand, please. I'm going to present you now for acceptance. Sir, I present Bradley White, Ryan Kaltiska, Timothy Valentine, Riley Hansen, Hannah Watkins, Nathan Clanton, Kyle Marker, Sonny Roxbrook, Jared Keffler, Jared Kaufman, Jordan Irwin, and Sheila Mott to be ordained as ministers in the Wesleyan Church and in the Church Universal. Dear friends, these are the ones we purpose, God willing, this day to ordain as ministers. For after due examination, we find that they are truly called. And that they are not only called to this function in ministry, but that they are qualified for the same. You may be seated. This is the reading of the epistle, which is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Ephesus. Written by the Apostle Paul, authored by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 through 9 says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this, ministry, this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. Then over to chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, 
the pastors and teachers to equip God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure the fullness of Christ. Our gospel reading comes from the gospel of John chapter 10, starting in verse 7. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also, for they too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd." Dear servants of God, you have heard both in your private examination by the District Board of Ministerial Development and in the message which has just been delivered something of the importance of the ministry to which you are called. Your under shepherds of the Good Shepherd, the Lord Jesus, called to teach and admonish to reach the lost and bring each person into a fullness of Christ. Remember always the greatness of this responsibility and give yourself to it without reservation. We charge you to pray daily for divine guidance so that by your study of the scriptures and your own growth, you may model Christ and lead the people God gives you in keeping with his example and his instruction. Great tradition on our district is the ordina or ordinated minister's choir. So we're going to do it now. So if you are ordained, please stand. And we're going to sing a charge to keep. And for all of us who've been around for a while, this is a great time for us to make this a renewal of our call and a renewal of our call. So let's lift it up together. Let's make it pretty. All right? Here we go. <clears throat> a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify. A never-dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. Arm me with jealous care, as in thy sight to live. And, O oh, thy servant, Lord, prepare a strict account to give. Help me to watch and pray, and on thyself rely. Assured if I my trust betray, I shall forever die. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask that those being ordained, would you stand, please? 
This assembled congregation represents the church of Jesus Christ everywhere as they witness your responses to the inquiries that we shall make of you. In this way, we will understand your mind and your will in these things, and perhaps you may as well be moved to greater faithfulness in doing your duties. So I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to give you the answer, and you are going to declare it enthusiastically so that we may hear your declarations today. Is it your sincere conviction that you have been called of God to the office and work of a minister, and are you persuaded that you ought to fulfill that calling as an ordained minister in the Wesleyan Church and among God's people everywhere? If so, answer that is my sincere conviction. Hey, we're off to a good start, and it's only going to get better. Do you believe the Holy Scriptures are the fully inspired and inerrant written word of God, containing sufficiently all doctrine necessary for eternal salvation through faith in Christ Jesus? And are you determined to instruct people from the Scriptures so that they may be born again in Christ, become committed to holy living, be prepared to serve for the upbuilding of the Christian community in this present age? If so, answer, all of this I believe and accept as my duty. Mm, I believe you do. Do you cordially accept our articles of religion, our membership commitments, agree to declare and defend them? Do you recognize your responsibility and cheerfully accept your obligation to promote and support the Wesleyan Church, all of its institutions and ministries as approved by the Wesleyan Church? If so, answer, yes, I do. Will you with diligence minister the doctrines, sacraments, and disciplines of Christ, being ready to challenge strange doctrine which is contrary to God's word wherever it may arise? If so, answer, I will as God enables me. Do you intend to make the reading of the word and effectual prayer your earnest pursuit? And do you uh, may, seek to make your lifestyle and family government exemplary so far as it is possible for you? If so, answer, yes, the Lord being my helper. Yes, the Lord being my helper. This is the final crescendo. Believing that accountability and acceptance of authority is God's design for his church, will you cheerfully accept the direction of those whom God may place over you in the doing of your work? If so, answer, I will cheerfully do so. They are smiling. I know you can't see it, but I feel the cheer. So I'm going to ask your spouses, if they would, to stand, please. And uh, this question is for you, spouses, only one. Is it the teaching? It is the teaching of Scripture. Not is it. It is the teaching of Scripture. <laughs> that a spouse shall be a loving companion in the ministry of a mate. You have just witnessed the examination of your marriage partner in which the commitment to work and responsibilities of ministry has been stated. Your participation in God's purposes for ministry through your marriage partner is important also. You will be needed to share in prayer, to extend love and compassion to all, to carry forward the example of marriage harmony and family wholesomeness. As the companion or of, your, of your loved one who is now entering the ranks of ordained ministry in the church, will you dedicate yourself to embrace that ministry as God enables you? If so, answer, I will by God's grace. I will by God's grace. Thank you so much. 
you all may be seated at this point. At this, privilege, at this point, we're privileged to ask you to come uh, one at a time in order that we might uh, have the privilege of ordaining you uh, to ministry this evening. And so I'm... Hi, my name is Sheila Mott. I'm honored to serve as the assistant pastor at Living Hope Wesleyan Church in Madison, South Dakota. I've been on staff since 2017. I've attended since 2014, along with my two daughters who are now ages 18 and 14. My call to ministry came when I was 15 years old, but the church affiliation I was with at the time did not allow me as a woman the option of pastoral ministry. So with the Bachelors of Youth Ministry from Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, God gave me opportunities in Christian camping and nonprofit management for 23 years that aligned with my gifts and passions and furthered my leadership through a Master's of Administrative Science from the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay. I did not plan to pursue ordination, but when God sent a number of people in a short amount of time who approached me and said, and why aren't you a pastor? I took the step of obedience that led to where I am today. It is with great purpose and joy that I get to help people discover and become who God has created them to be. Sheila, we're so glad you've stayed hand in hand with God through the twists and turns of that journey and for those people who spoke into your life. It's really an honor to place our hands upon you today, to extend our hands towards you. Lord, we are thank you, thanking you for your call upon Sheila's life. And we now, in these moments, place our hands upon her because we want to ask you, Lord, to give Sheila an unusual outpouring of your Holy Spirit that will be needed for her service as an ordained minister in the Wesleyan Church. And we pray, Lord, that you, through your anointing, your empowerment, will make her a faithful exponent of your word. And so, Sheila, we place this word before you. Your hands are upon it. And we say to you, Sheila, take authority to preach the word of God, to administer the sacraments, to perform the duties as an ordained minister in the Wesleyan Church. And may you do it all and always in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Merciful and just God. We're here celebrating the way you have worked and moved in the life of your loved and called daughter, Sheila. To this point, over and over on this journey of ministry, you started her on and continue to lead her on. You have demonstrated your faithfulness, your compassion, and your love. I am in awe of the way in which you have proven to her that she has been counted as loyal and called to bring your kingdom to the world in which she lives. Saving and merciful Jesus, you gave up your control in heaven so we can have a future filled with hope and be with you. And you demonstrated what that kingdom of heaven on earth looked like as you served and loved Judas as well as John. I pray every day Sheila will follow and live out this example of the kingdom of God at your table of grace to all she comes in contact with. Guiding and transforming Holy Spirit, I pray as Elisha did to his guide and his leader that you come over Sheila with a double portion of wisdom, mercy, empathy, joy, and power. Tonight, I celebrate you, God, Christ, and Spirit, for your proven faithfulness in Sheila's life. In the days ahead, as she leads her two amazing daughters in their faith and transition moments, daily remind them all of your presence and love. May Sheila's seed of faith spread far. May she celebrate your harvest in her life. For yours alone, God, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good prayer. Well, Sheila, as your testimony just told us and other things tell us, you are a person of perseverance. You are here. It hadn't been easy for you. And you've, you've gone through hurdles and 
through obstacles. God bless you for that. You're not done, by the way. <laughs> I, I just got to tell you that. <laughs> I, mean, I, I thought I was going to quit and I'm still doing it. So I'm just telling you. It, but you can do it. You've demonstrated that and the grace of God is with you. It's, it's wonderful uh, that, that God's strength is on your side and in you. It's also way cool that your daughter's here to stand with you in this. And uh, thank you for being a good example for her. And thank God for his grace in your life. So it's a privilege to give you this certificate. It's all official now. And one last time I will say this today. <laughs> on behalf of the members and ministers of the Wesleyan Church, our general superintendent, our district superintendent, the district board of ministerial development, it is my privilege to give you the right hand of fellowship. You, madam, are an ordained minister in the Wesleyan Church. Well, friends, here we are. That was number 12. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your participation. It's been wonderful for you to be with us. And I would invite you, if you would, would you just stand with me for the benediction? It comes from Hebrews chapter 13, and listen carefully to these words. May the God of peace, who through the everlasting covenant bought, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, May he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We are dismissed. Just slowly take your time, and we'll, we'll exit out as we have opportunity. But thank you very much for your support. <laughs>